Oh, good morning. I'm Phil Jackson. We've been coming down here for five years. This is my husband, Mitchell Jackson. We're from Burgess, Virginia. And uh, we're going to take you a tour of uh, the Jar Center and some of the things we've seen while we were here. First of all, we're in the town building, the main administration building. And uh, the signs here tell us what Jars does. Good morning, we're outside the uh, We're going to walk over at Washington Street to the Mexico Cardenas Museum. And, uh, so we'll go over there now. Okay, I'm at the front door of the Mexico Cardenas Museum. It's not open just yet. It'll be open shortly. Uh, but uh, this museum contains artifacts from Mexico. It also contains Cameron Town. This is, a, I believe, it's a 1935 Chevrolet automobile. And uh, uh, some documents, I believe, that President Cardenas of Mexico uh, gave to Wycliffe. And also, I believe, uh, the Mexican... Uh, the country of Mexico also contributed to the construction of this museum. It's quite interesting. And if you're on the center, you can take uh, time to look inside here. We're sorry we can't show you the contents today, but perhaps some other time. Our next stop is going to be at the Alphabet Museum. Let's go for a walk down there now, Richard. Okay, here we are at the Museum of the Alphabet. All right, we're now over at the Museum of the Alphabet. We're going to take a short look inside there. Uh, this is one of the most interesting buildings on the uh, center here. It uh, really explains what Wycliffe really does. It gives the history of the alphabet, the different you know, root languages and so forth of the alphabet. It's, uh, it's quite complex. If you do come down here, plan to spend as much time as you can looking at this. It's not a, you can go through there in 10 minutes, but you won't see a whole lot. But if you it's worth all the time that you can devote to it. All right, we're now inside the Alphabet Museum. In fact, we're just inside the door. And the first thing you see beyond the reception desk over on the far right is the Tower of Babel. And uh, it, the camera won't do it justice, but it's uh, made of metal. And it shows the... Uh, Real confusion that took place when uh, the Lord saw fit to uh, create all so many different languages so that the people could not communicate with each other. And uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, sculpture here. I don't know uh, really who made it, but uh, perhaps uh, Walter can fill you in on that. And it's uh, well worth your time. Okay, we're standing at a exhibit here called the Alphabet Tree and shows the primary languages of the world and the, the roots and the, I, if you study it, I guess you can find out what's common, where, where, where all our different languages came from. We see here, for instance, uh, that's the Medic, which comes up this Sabiasm, and then we get Ethiopic. I suppose Ethiopic is still a language that's spoken. I'm not sure, but this is just an example of the things that are in here. And there's, there's a lot of detail, and it's well worth your time if you can make a trip down here to Jars. And please uh, spend some time here in the Alphabet Museum. Tell me 
something about it. All right, these are the 10 alcoves in the museum. The first is on the uh, ancient history of writing. Alcoves 2 through 7 are on the major writing systems used in the world today. In other words, the most important modern alphabet. And then alcove 8 is on um, sign language and braille. And the last two, 9 and 10, are on the work of SIL or WBT, which is um, modern alphabet making, uh, going to the people and giving them an alphabet so they can learn to read and, and use their new testament. Well, thank you so much for, for giving us a rundown on just how the uh, our museum is set up. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'm standing by the uh, little display here that tells you how to write your name in Egyptian hieroglyphics. You take a rubber stamp, there's a new case, this is the letter F, and it looks like a, uh, looks like a, a bird of some kind. I'm not too sure what it is. Maybe it's a camel lying down. It's a little hard to tell. See, I don't read hieroglyphics too well. So if your name is Frank, it means F. And let's see if I can find an R here. R looks like a set of lips. And let me see. A is a bird. We stamp that down for A. And let's see. Uh, N. At least the Egyptians had a letter N. Yes, they had an N here. It looks like a... Uh, picture of a uh, series of three mountains here, the peak of three mountains. And the K, let's see, they had a K, F, K, and K equals a snake, serpent. So that's how you would write Frank. This display here is of the Arabic alphabet. It uh, tells you how to write Arabic, how to read it. How to read it, first of all, you read it from right to left. Most form, the letters have four forms depending on their place and a sequence of letters. Letter C, complete alphabet to left. It gets a little complicated. The writing is cursive, like our handwriting. There is no style of unjoined letters. And then it gives an example of it. Many letter shapes are identical except for dots, which are integral parts of the letters. Dots are not vowels. And that goes on with more and more detail about how to write Arabic, and it continues all the way over here. So Arabic is, learning to write Arabic is not quite as simple as the Roman alphabet, I don't believe. But uh, Mitchell, could you look to the left and uh, see what this alphabet actually looks like? All right. From right to left, the columns show the letter forms. When not joined, uh, it gives the phonic value of how to pronounce it. And if it's joined on the right, it means it's one thing. If it's joined on both sides, it's something else. And if it's joined on the left, it's the third thing. So uh, I'm reading it from left to right, and I'm supposed to read it from right to left. <laughs> well, so I'm confused already, but this is the Arabic alphabet here. Well, thank you very much. This is an exhibit here uh, of the Ten Commandments. It was uh, carved by Joe Harvey. These are not the complete Ten Commandments. It says here we have the first part of each commandment. So this would be the first part of the first commandment. Well, I believe in Hebrew we read from the bottom. This would be the first of the first commandment, the second commandment, and so forth. Richard, wait for me. We'll say goodbye to the museum and, and uh, go on uh, further on our tour of JARS. On our way over to the airfield at JARS, we come across this uh, building where a great deal of the activity takes place. A lot of work. And this is the uh, computer. Let me see if I can bring that into focus. This is the International Computer Services Building. On the opposite side of the road, we have communications. This is where we keep in contact with the different JAR Center 
over the entire world. And if you let me file this, you're going to see, I don't know if you can see it today, but there's quite an antenna up here. And just a little bit uh, north of it, you will find another antenna. Now, I don't know how much you're going to see with all this light. Now, the ducks do have to go by, and this is a public road, so here we are. This is a tour group that's entering the communications building now. Tours are held every day in the week. And many people have their first introduction to JARS through these tours at the JARS Center. We are now entering the purchasing and shipping area. So this is a tremendous service okay. that JARS Center uh, performs. I do realize that people all over the world depend upon what goes on in this building and these trucks and with this dedicated group of personnel. It, uh, most people don't think of purchasing and shipping as missionary work, but believe me, the missionaries could not function without this department jars. Not only does this department handle purchasing and shipping for the WICRF personnel, when they they handle purchasing shipping for other missions throughout the world. And all of that takes place in this modest little building here in Waxhaw, North Carolina. Directly behind uh, the purchasing and shipping building is another one with this title called uh, Material Transportation Department Office. That's a fancy name for trucking. Trucking is an integral part of this whole system here. You can't purchase and ship unless you have trucks. And you have to have a way of transporting them. And all of that is handled in this modest little building. Okay. My name is Tony Carbridge, and I'm the director of the Materials Transportation Department for the Yards. And uh, we partner the Cotton Bell in the United States and Canada with our trucks. We have six tractor trailers that we do this with. And, um, last year, we saved missions of a million dollars by using our own vehicles over to the break. And it's more than just a dollar savings, but it's also the personal handling and care of uh, transporting our own goods and the personal interaction with our members that are going over soon. People that are moving up and come out to the older seats are in a high stress situation. And it's always a relief for them to have somebody come and say, we'll help you. Uh, we'll take care of this for you. And uh, so we feel good about what we're doing. We're the store members as well for saving them money. Um, we have three terminals. We have a terminal in Riverside, California. They ship off the West Coast to the South Pacific. Our main terminal is here at Waxhaw. Which covers the East Coast, we ship out of uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, and uh, air freight out of Charlotte. Uh, we also have a small terminal in Dallas, Texas. That's where our linguistic school is and where our linguists uh, prepare, prepare for going overseas. So on our cross country trips, our trucks are going to stop at Dallas and then the Riverside. And then when they come back, to uh, east, that they repeat the same process. The Lord calls people on the West Coast to serve in Africa and South America, and He calls some people on the East Coast to serve in the South Pacific. So this uh, works out very economically for us to have our own trucks as we take uh, cargo, uh, personal effects, and supplies uh, uh, to the very ports we ship overseas. And it's uh, turned out to be a very profitable uh, in the terms of savings to our mission organization. So I enjoyed my little chat with you, and I'm glad that you stopped by and let me share a little bit with you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome.
I found it very interesting. It's on the outside wall of the building for construction and maintenance. Otherwise known as CAM. Uh, Okay, this is construction and maintenance building here. And it says, please wipe your feet before entering. You're very neat here. Here I am. My wife has been down here too, but she has been on it. All right. My name is Jane Denny, and I'm the office manager here in the construction and maintenance department. And if Phil McBride, our director, were here, he'd be able to explain to you what CAM really is. But Phil McBride is presently in Africa surveying our construction and maintenance needs. So that's what CAM stands for, construction and maintenance. And we are meeting the needs of our equipment personnel, our translators, all over the world with their construction and maintenance needs. We go and build little houses and villages, and we build buildings, study centers, and houses on our centers in various locations, like we just over here in Indonesia and in Papua New Guinea, which is over here, have completed a study center for our translators who are working among the tribal languages there in Papua New Guinea. We here in the Construction and Maintenance Department at the JAR Center in Waxhaw, North Carolina, train our men to do this. Presently, we have five men in our orientation program, which lasts for three months. These men have an expertise in a particular area. They might be, that area of expertise might be oil mechanics, it might be construction, it might be electrical. But we need to train them in other areas so that the electrician can also go in and repair cars, and so he can also do some building and perhaps do some plumbing. plumbing. And the auto mechanic, he can go and uh, not only do auto mechanicing, but he can do some construction and repair refrigerators and air conditioners and stoves. We like to send our men out with an all-round uh, knowledge. And so we have a three-month orientation course going on now where we are training our men to go out into some place in the world and share their construction and maintenance needs with our translators. And that is our main purpose here in the construction and maintenance department. We also do give advice in construction and maintenance areas uh, here uh, to individuals who have problems or have need of repairs, such as their refrigerators in their homes or their toasters. And uh, we also do the construction and maintenance in our, on the JAR Center, maintaining all the buildings here. Our uh, department consists of about 40 personnel, and we're all here for the main purpose and the ultimate goal of doing Bible translation in all the various countries around the world, here in Latin America, Africa, the Pacific area, Asia, and in Europe and in North America, all over the world, is our goal to reach those who do not have God's word in their own language. The complex here at JARS is so large that we have our own volunteer fire department, all built by volunteer labor. We're recording now.
Flynn and Walter, what are you doing over there? Could you share with us? Well, right now, I'm updating some folks in our software program. We get to the out of the machine, find out just what program to send. I'm recording it in the books, and that's how we have a copy of everything that is recorded in the machine. Well, what happens is that the, that the telephone equipment is controlled by the computer words that we write into the sim. We actually type in a certain command and change the configuration of the telephone system. And we are rewriting all of the software to eliminate some problems we have. So Len and I are working together to rewrite the whole program probably 20,000 different addresses to, uh, to make the thing work better. You know, this is an entirely new concept to me that uh, computers and telephones work together. It was new to us too. Three years ago when we got this system, we uh, we had always worked with the electromechanical telephone systems and um, we had to learn how to do the computer type by doing it. What is your telephone system here, Walter? Well, if you want to move over and take a look at it here. This is uh, a GTD 1000 um, PBX. It's, it is completely computerized. The, all the programming information that we're writing in is contained in memory on this shelf here in the you know, in the chips on this, these cards. And while we're talking, it doesn't exactly switch a conversation. It just changes the words into computer language and unscrambles them at the other end. So we use this to supply the center. It, will, it will, has a capacity of about a thousand lines. And right now we have 500 uh, lines, 500 telephones. And we have 17 trunks that connect us to wax on and go from there the rest of the world. Well, thank you for sharing with us some of this, uh, about this tremendous telephone system here at Walter. Bethany, we ought to get a big one Bethany. Walter, you're just going to have to share your desk with us, and especially with the pictures of your beautiful grandchildren. Ah, uh, let's see if you can bring them up. Who are they? Could you show them to us? Starting on the left is Caroline, then Erin, and then the little picture there is all oh, these are old pictures, but those are Joyce children. And then we have the one sorry, I got wrong. <laughs> the little picture is uh, Becky, Wally's daughter, and then the picture to the right is Holly, Joyce children. Oh well thank you so much. It's it's always nice to see where somebody belongs at their desk. How about that? <laughs> Lynn, it would, this office wouldn't be complete without you. Now, come on. Lynn, Lynn is a co-worker with uh, Walter, and between the two of them, they keep this place humming. Okay, Lynn? We try to keep it humming, but we really need somebody else to help us, because it's more than two of us can handle. Amen. And when one of us is here by herself, which is mostly Walter, he's almost out of his mind trying to keep it going. Amen. But it is a a big job, and we really appreciate the help these people come down and give us, because without you, we would know what we were doing half the time, or half of it would be done, I'll just put it that way. It's a wonderful pleasure to come down, for Richard and I to come down and work with you and uh, Walter Flynn. Well, we're glad to have you, and glad to have any other telephone people out there who want to come down and help. Telephone people, take note, you're wanted down I here at yours. We can turn now to the Mexico Cardenas Museum, and Joy Bowles is going to give us a, a tour. This is what we missed out on earlier. This is where Joy works and spends a great deal of her time. All right, Joy, do you want to introduce us to the museum? Hi, this will just be very brief. This museum was built uh, in honor of the country of Mexico and specifically President Cardenas, who was a very excellent president of Mexico from 1932 to 1940. He's the one who invited Uncle Sam Townsend to come into Mexico and start work among the Mexican people, and this is the Mexican Indians, actually. And this is actually where Wycliffe Bible Translators started, started growing. I have enjoyed working here part-time 
you have to come inside and look around a while. All right, thank you, Joy. But you're sort of official manager, your manager of the next film museum. Oh, okay, okay. I have enjoyed working here with Marjorie. Marjorie and her husband are also in the attendance at our Sunday school. But he does a good job keeping everything going in here. Oh, thank you very much. This is the flag of Mexico. It's beautifully embroidered on both sides. It has an eagle sitting on a cactus plant with a serpent in its mouth. And it, this is because of an old Aztec legend. And it's just very beautifully done. All right. This is a bust of President Cardenas. Uh, this was made by one of our Wickless kids that grew up in several different South American countries and then in Papua New Guinea. My kids knew him very well. And this was very fascinating because his head is actually made out of an old Maytag washing machine. And look at his mustache and his eyebrows. They're made out of chopped up coat hangers. But his, his mother was half Indian, I believe. Is that right? And she, he was a real champion of the Indian people. He was very, very big to them. He was a very good president. Yes. This is a Zapotec lady. They live on the Isthmus of Mexico, where the main highway to Panama goes through. And uh, this is the costume that they wear when they, wherever they're dressed up. And this is hand embroidered on black velvet. And uh, if you'd like to see the headdress, the headdress looks like a little girl's dress. They don't know why they wear that. They uh, made up a story finally to answer the tourists who kept asking questions. They said many years ago, a Spanish ship was wrecked off the coast, and when they opened the little trunks that washed ashore, they found little girls' dresses. And uh, they put them on their heads because they didn't need them. They already had the shoes. But I just wanted to say how much we appreciate Joy in the museum and also at the church. Joy and Walter, we just, uh, so many times I call up Joy and say, what do you think about this? <laughs> we have a good conversation, and we, we really do appreciate you. We're very thankful that they came to you. Marjorie is really my mother substitute at this point. She, I treasure her for so much, and she means the world to me. Thank you. We have a good time together. Thank you, both of you. There's quite a story about this car, and we're going to wait a minute till Joy comes back so she can share the story with her. This is a car that President Crowley has gave as a gift to Uncle Sam Townsend and his first wife. Her health was very bad. She had very bad heart condition and had a lot of problems, and they couldn't afford to buy a car. And they were traveling all around Mexico. Either on on foot or in public transportation. And President Cardenas purchased this car brand new in 1938, and it has gone 327,000 miles. It drove in here in the museum on its own power, and they say if you put gas and oil in it, you could drive it right out now. And it has many fascinating stories. I wish I had time to tell you. One of the most interesting is of Little baby boy was born in the back seat one day when the car was stuck in in uh, downtown Mexico City in five o'clock traffic. Thank you, Joey, for telling us the story of the car. All right, I have it. This is a fascinating piece of Mexican artwork. This is made from yarn embedded in beeswax, and it's just beautifully done. This is sitting in our most important room here in the Mexico Museum. This is our room showing why we were in Mexico, why we are doing our work in any country in order for, to learn the languages, these unwritten languages, to translate the Bible into the languages for the people. On the table here we have primers, which are beginning reader books for people to 
learn to read. Many of them are counting books, story books, geography books, which are necessary for helping them become literate. Then over on the right, we have three complete we have three completed New Testaments here. This one is especially interesting because this has the Indian dialect at the top, and down here at the bottom it has the Spanish. This is called a Diplot translation, and this is to specifically to help the people learn to read in their own language and then to be able to have the Spanish, which is the national language, to make the transition into becoming literate in the national language also. Many of the materials are in both languages. And then I always love to show people this. Would you believe this is the New Testament? There's 3,000 languages around the world. Would you like to see it? All of the pages are blank because we still have three thousand languages representing over three million people that still do not have one word of God's word in their language. It's just totally blank. Thank you very much, George, for sharing with us the story behind the Mexico Cardina Museum. Thank you. Oh, hi, Richard. Good to see you. Welcome to my uh, workstation here. What I've been doing today is taking base plates like this and building telephones. First, I have to look at the telephone, decide what it needs, and find a bell and test the bell by plugging in this cord here. I like to do this because it makes a lot of noise. And find out whether my bell's good or not. Let's see if we can make it ring. What that does is tells me that this red lead and this gray red lead are the good leads. So I know I have a good ringer for a telephone. Then of course we have to have a dial. So I take this contraption with all the wires, making a special care to note what kind of a dial it is so that I can install it on our telephone. You see each dial that has a different number has different windings, different connections, and so you have to be sure and get the right dial. And there's all, I don't, I'm lucky, there's a switch hook already available here. Another component I need is the network. You can't have a telephone without a network. So we put the network in place and go through all of these many drawers and find the proper screws to put the network in place. And then we put the uh, bell in and the dial. We're all ready to start working on our telephone. Sometimes we need pliers. Sometimes we need a screwdriver. But before you're finished, you take an old telephone like this, an old-fashioned, old, dirty, old dial phone that doesn't operate. And the finished product will be a beautiful, new-looking telephone like this that you'd be well, glad to have in your own home or office. So that's primarily what I'm doing here, rebuilding old telephones and taking telephones like this one that won't work and finding out why they won't work and repairing them. So that's what I've been doing down here at JARS. Have you any more questions? No more questions. All right, thank you very much. This afternoon, I came over to the communications building so we could find out just what communications in JARS have to do with the whole Wycliffe um, uh, program. Uh, today, I'm sitting in the office of Ernie Thelma, who's the director of communications. Good afternoon, Ernie. 
Hi, how are you doing, fellas? We appreciate you and Dick being here. Let me tell you just a little bit about the communications department. We have a number of sections that uh, uh, are under this department. First of all is our electronic section. Uh, we have an office machine section, audio servicing section, a solar section, and the telephone. A solar uh, section? Right. Uh, a lot of our translators are now using solar equipment, solar photovoltaic cells, uh, for their power in their remote villages rather than the candles they used to use or possibly kerosene plants or lanterns. Uh, some of them, of course, used to uh, take out motor generators driven by, powered by gasoline. Now, instead of that, they uh, they take a couple of our solar panels along, a couple of batteries, and then 12 volt lights, fans. They can use it for their tape recorders, their computers. Also use it for uh, for fans. Uh, a couple of our uh, our translators have uh, even ordered 12 volt refrigerators. So uh, the advantage, of course, to uh, to solar. Uh, a number, uh, first of all, there's no fuel. Well, it provides the fuel whenever the sun shines. Uh, it's quiet, there's no noise, there's very little maintenance to a system like this. All of these, which are very, very much of a, of a joy to the, to the translators because then they can go ahead with the work that they're supposed to be doing rather than trying to keep their, their lights and so forth in operation. But anyway, back to the communications department. Uh, our main reason for being here is training of technical people uh, to go out to their field of service. I think, Phyllis, that you uh, uh, you talked with Jane Denier a little while ago about uh, CAM, construction and maintenance. We also do the same thing here. We take specialists in certain areas and broaden them out so that they'll have an opportunity and have the capability of training nationals as well as keeping the equipment overseas going at our overseas center. Uh, our office machines, well, all of these areas, we also do the service here at the JAR Center. That's in electronics all the electronic equipment, all of our office machines equipment, we uh, we repair and maintain that. Uh, and of course, in the telephone system, uh, we keep that in operation. Uh, along with providing service and help, information and uh, advice to people overseas who are working on their systems and need to extra help. Uh, I haven't mentioned anything about our communication room. We have a room here where uh, sort of the nerve center of the JARS group. Uh, in that room, we have our computer electronic mail. We have a couple of fax machines. We have packet radio. And we have amateur radio in there. All of these are various ways for us to contact our overseas centers as well as the translators overseas. Uh, in our communication room, we do a lot of, uh, uh, of relaying of messages, particularly by fax. I bet you didn't know that uh, a telephone call from here to Cote d'Ivoire over in West Africa costs about one-fourth of what it costs for them to call us. Now, if we call them on our fax machine and send our messages and then turn around and ask their message, their, their fax machine to send their messages to us, we can make all of this communication on one telephone call. The messages we get from them may not be to JARS, it may be to our California office. Uh, it may be to Canada. It may be back over to Kenya and East Africa. 
but it's cheaper for them to have us contact them, pick up their messages, than for them to send them directly or to send them to us. So uh, all of this is part of the service that we in the support area, which is JARS, are doing to keep Bible translation going worldwide, especially overseas. Well, that is so interesting, Ernie. And here's something I hadn't thought of before. This makes the money that the people from churches and other places contribute to Wicklick go a much longer distance. So that's that right. really, it's been a tremendous help and really stretching the Lord's money. That's right. There's one other thing I want to mention. We appreciate uh, people like uh, Richard and Phyllis Haxton, too. Because I was downstairs just a little while ago where Phyllis has been working. I don't know whether she's going to have pictures of this or not. But she's got a shelf full of repaired telephone instruments. Some of them will be used here at Jar Center. But there's also going to be a lot of them that will be used overseas. So the work that she and Richard are doing down here as volunteers, all on their own, no pay, uh, that's part of Bible translation, too, and we appreciate that. Well, we appreciate uh, you learning and the people here at the center very much. And there's something else to remember. You all are volunteers in a sense, too. Well, the Lord provides for all of us, doesn't he? He's sure a wonderful Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Ernie. All right. You're sure welcome. This is Paul Close, one of the workers at communications department. Hello. Hi, Paul. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. What are you doing? I'm typing on our packet radio setup. Our communications line with uh, Columbia, South America, and the group South America through ham radio and the computer. Oh, that sounds very interesting. Right now, uh, uh, one of our technicians down there wrote me a message asking for some assistance in finding uh, location or what, what a particular transistor was. So I researched that for him, and I'm sending back in the, the data on what I think might help with those. Good. I'll let you get back to uh, your message. Later. Thank you very much. You start it, and I'll look up. Good afternoon, Doyle Tallman. Uh, Doyle Tallman is a worker here at the communications department in JARS. Doyle, I wonder if you could tell, give us an idea of this, what it is that you're doing. Well, at this moment, I'm just building a simple little power supply for a very specialized tape recorder. This machine is used for recording uh, programs, shall we say, cassette programs in the villages so that the people to whom uh, for whom we're translating can also have cassette programs that might be scripture on tape or uh, teaching of one sort or another and it's just a little tiny cog in the wheel of, of uh, bible translation and related ministries that sounds very interesting but speaking about a little cog in the wheel seems to me i was reading in Ephesians today, that uh, there's hands and feet involved, and it's fingers, and fingers, and uh, those are as much a part of Bible translation as, as somebody standing up and evangelizing. Well, it takes uh, takes lots of lots of different fingers on different hands doing things that by themselves don't really seem all that uh, earth shaking, but it's it's really a thrill. To, to have a part. And I, I've uh, stopped sometimes uh, what I'm doing to thank God for the chance to be involved in one little way in, in getting his word to the people that I haven't heard. I think it's a wonderful privilege to be able to help in this program. It is a blessing. Thank you so much, Doyle. Have a good day. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. What is this? The jars. Is there a swing so I can if, uh, help detoxify the point injected by either snake 
scorpions, spiders, wasps, anything that works on the principle that there's a coil in here. Well, and a motor from the instant wiper, you turn it and it generates your electricity. You hold it down. And that red the spark, you got hold it. It's the spark. Hold it yeah. And that detoxifies the snake bite. If you got bit in your hand, you would lay your hand right on here. Put this probe right on the hole where the fang mark, turn the crank about three times, and do the same thing on the other. That would detoxify and poison the well, the, the reason is, what's the reason is that venom is that's a metallic substance. So the, uh, the venom on the snake, scorpions, are all has a positive protein ion. It goes in a positive clockwise condition. And this here reverses it. And that breaks it down. So it detoxifies itself. Now, if you just have a bee sting or a snake bite, you take this paddle off and put the other paddle on. And then put this, put this right over your snake bite or your uh, insect, put this in the middle, and just turn it lightly about three turns. Would you like to carry one of those long with you, Phyllis? Do you be staying instead of the instead of the Benadryl tablets? You can carry a stun gun with you. I, I think it would work. <laughs> I think it would work better than the Benadryl tablets, but I don't think I want to carry such a big contraption. Thank you so much for demonstrating the snake bite kit. Thank you. Thank you This is the aviation machine shop where the parts are made for the aircraft engines and anything to do with air with the airplane. Right. Right. All right. And your name is My name's John Funk. Well you're John Funk and John you, you head up this uh department. Hmm? Yes. Uh this was my dream from way back in nineteen fifty nine. Oh fine. I felt the need for a machine shop. I know they needed one and it wasn't until just three years ago that this whole shop has developed. Well, and, uh, I've uh, become George Machinist uh, 1961 in the jungles of Peru, South America. And uh, we had some airplanes that weren't flying and they were set aside. And I, I asked the question, how come those planes aren't flying? And they said, well, uh, we're waiting for parts. And we waited six months to a year sometimes for parts. And then sometimes when they come down, they're wrong. And a big disappointment that is. So I said, well, let, let me see the parts you're waiting for. So they showed me a couple of valves that fit in a part of an engine in an aircraft. And I said, wow, I said, I can make that part today and you can fly the airplane tomorrow. And it just happens that we had two lathes, that would be these two over here in the jungle, similar to these two lathes. And uh, I was able to make the part and they did fly the airplane in just a couple of days. And, uh, it turned out that uh, after that experience, I became George Machinist from 1962 until now. And I've done several jobs in between, like purchasing parts for George in Miami for eight years. And uh, all the time, I'm still thinking about this shop. And I had the problem of not being able to get parts down there. So uh, the Lord has provided all this equipment, donated it, and he supplied men like uh, Skipper down there, and this is Gary. And they're uh, willing helpers that have come down to give us a, give us a month of their time, sometimes twice a year. And uh, they really crank out the work, and we really praise the Lord for these guys, and they do a super, super job. We love them, and uh, we love to see them come. So, uh, well, that's wonderful. And that's, you're re really doing uh, quite a, a uh, big service here at Jars and a service to the Lord. Yeah, I would say we're keeping the airplanes flying. We have 20 Helios that are flying in the world, throughout the world. And a Helio is a short takeoff airplane that can take off in, uh, I've seen it take off in 60 feet. And it says, the literature says it can land at 28 miles an hour. So Uncle Cam, our founder of Wycliffe, believes the Lord led us to, 
to that airplane, but the company went out of business. And uh, there's no way of getting parts, and we are, we're able to make them. We have the blueprint from Helio, and we're able to make all the parts that we need right here. And we have a metal shaft that backs us up on the other side of the hangar. And between the two of us, we keep those airplanes flying. And of course, we have the mechanics, of course, that put the parts on the airplane. Well, I think that's wonderful. And thank you so much, uh, Mr. Funk, for sharing this with us. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Our pleasure. Praise the Lord. Uh, we brought it down here on a truck, and we're uh, rebuilding it. We said tip in the, the vent just a little bit, so we had to take it all apart and replace all the damage and put new, new uh, laminated skins on the top box. That's about all. When we get done, we hope to truck it back up to uh, up to Ohio again, put it on the airplane. We have a crew up there also that's working on the, uh, on the airplane. What? Got some real help today. Hey, you can pour that on the floor. You could get it over, you should not get it all over. The last few scenes I took in the jars hangar, uh, an airplane that they were working on, and also the wings of the DC 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 eight DC three that that's slated to go to Africa, slated to go to Africa uh, as soon as they can uh, have it repaired. There was an accident in Ohio, and the, uh, the crash in an airfield, the problem with one of the motors. And now I took pictures of the wings, and they're here in the uh, hangar jars being worked on. Then they'll be flown back uh, to Ohio, and they'll be put on the plane, and they'll be ready to go. This is a picture of the runway. Windsocks over the building there. And it goes quite a distance. Let me bring you slowly around here. And then we're going to see one of their uh, heli helio carriers, a short wing, uh, quick takeoff planes that they have in use around the world. And over here behind this uh, step, these steps that they use to get up into the large plane, you'll see a couple more of the uh, uh, helio carriers. This is the uh, one of the main reasons, I believe, why the uh, jars was situated here in the first place was the training of these uh, uh, pilots, pilots, so that they could be able to fly in, in very uh, bad terrain and jungle situations. So that that was one of the reasons why this whole um, uh, complex was situated here in uh, Northeast Carolina. They were fortunate enough to receive land that would was uh, similar to the area that they would be using the uh, planes in. This particular plane that I'm taking is a rather important. You can notice that the yarn is uh, attached to different places around the uh, wings and feet line. And a uh, little flag came down. This is an experimental plane, and uh, for this moment, I'll bring us over to the sign because that explains it much better than I can. This is a Helio Aerial Dynamic Internet Project. The Helio target is being used for research that will enable it to fly faster on the same power. The idea being that a faster helio will cross fiber connector that has to get to and from the that we work. There we can add on to sick going back and forth. This is using the cross between the fiber and the early man's language. Passing short pieces of black yarn take to the plane's review to study this don't want to see the 
hair we replaced faded brown parts we replaced faded brown. Modification to the different clothes, faster or children's condition speed increase. Today we have boosted the speed by about ten nautical miles an hour. Thank you. Well, if you didn't get busy with all my music, you'd find we're still working hard here at Jars to uh, make the most of everything possible in this translation. This guy's on the east. Well, we're back home, Burgess, Virginia, for 17 days on Jars at Jars. We hope you enjoyed the, the tour as much as we did. and. Uh, we're glad to be home, however, and we would like to go back down there again. Bye for now.